to an oral history of the church. I'm Adam Crispin. And I'm Jonathan McCormick. An oral history of the church is a conversational history podcast. This first volume is an oral history of the campus relocation of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's main campus. From Mill Valley, California to Ontario, California. The school has a new name as of June 2016. Gateway Seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. The 14th episode for this volume is an interview with Dr. Bryce Butler, two-time alumnus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary and senior pastor of Tiburon Baptist Church. Jonathan, I was really glad that uh, Bryce was able to make the time to talk with me. I'm sorry that you couldn't come. Uh, he has a tight schedule and we did what we could, <laughs> you know. Um, but Bryce is a significant contribution to this study because he's, as as you mentioned, he's an alumnus. But as the pastor of Tiburon Baptist Church, he pastors a congregation that is saying goodbye to the seminary. They are they have sold and are vacating that Mill Valley property, but he and his church are staying behind. They're, they're going to stay in Mill Valley, Tiburon specifically, of course. Um, so it's real interesting to have this helpful perspective from another local pastor who also has other connections to the seminary. Correct. Um, Bryce Butler lives within walking distance of the seminary. Yeah. And Tiburon, I've made the walk three times uh, from the <laughs> seminary campus. It's not, it's just on that edge of being a comfortable walk um, where you are in the church and people will want you to be there. And if it was a little farther, you might smell like you took the hike um <laughs> yeah well it's if it's within view of the seminary as well yes um if you stand within what used to be the library building and look out those big bay windows you can see the the three tall white crosses and the buildings of tiburon baptist church and likewise if you're standing on the tiburon uh, Baptist Church property, you can see the library building and the peaks of the other two main buildings at the seminary campus. Since the recording of this interview, there is now a bench at that spot at Tiburon mm -hmm. looking back at the the seminary site. Yeah. Well, um, let's not belabor this too much. Uh, upcoming is an interview with Bryce Butler. This interview took place in his uh, backyard, so there will be some noise from passing cars on the road nearby, um, but we hope you enjoy it. Dr. Bryce Butler. This is Adam Chrisman interviewing Dr. Bryce Butler on July 22nd, 2016. This interview is taking place at his home in Mill Valley, California. Bryce, thank you again for being willing to sit down with me. I'm sorry Jonathan couldn't be here. He's out of town at the moment. Um, but I'm real excited to get another perspective from somebody who's not only an alumnus, but also a local minister in the area that the seminary is leaving. Um, it, it means a lot to me and to the study that we're doing. Uh, but let's just dive into the questions. Okay. So how did you first hear about Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? Uh, well, I just want to say thank you again, Adam, to you, and uh, it's an honor to be part of this. Um, and I miss Jonathan, um, <laughs> but uh, glad to be with you. Um, I first heard about Golden Gate um, when I was preparing to be a journeyman back uh, in 1994, a uh, journeyman missionary through the International Mission Board, uh, uh, part of our uh, training before we headed overseas. Uh, Mike Thompson, who is a history professor here, uh, came out and um, taught part of part of the training, and um, uh, he 
we were all enamored with his piano playing and <laughs> his uh, wonderful ear. He could just sit down and play just about anything, it seemed. Wow. Um, and the fact that he had roots in Oklahoma was an interesting connection for me. And mm. um, So that was the first that I'd ever heard about Golden Gate. But at that time, I had not even considered seminary mm. um, uh, as a potential future education for me at all. But uh, mm -hmm. when it did come time to consider seminaries, it was in part because of Mike Thompson and um, my connection with him. Gotcha. So were you in college or just out of college at that time? I had just graduated, and uh, a few months later I was in uh, Richmond. Uh, it was called the MLC back then, Missionary Learning Center. Okay. And uh, so Mike, uh, uh, he came out. Uh, I should call him Dr. Thompson, I guess. But uh, <laughs> he uh, always asked us to call him Mike then. But he made um, really impressed me because he, this is back before, the internet or email or anything else and he uh, always kept uh, he made a promise and kept that promise where if any journeyman uh, when they got on the field if they wanted to write him that he would write them back and mm -hmm. uh, he, he did that with many not just in my group but many others before me and I'm sure after mm -hmm. and I, I think he used to pay his own way because he he so enjoyed uh, the journeyman program and, and the students who were heading out Mm. Um, to do that and so yeah mm -hmm. all right and how did you first come to study at Golden Gate Seminary well when I came back from uh, my journeyman time I was in France for two years came back mm. uh, my brother uh, is a pastor down in Southern California and he and I uh, before at some point along the way decided when I returned from uh, my mission time that I would move out uh, instead of going back to Oklahoma I'd move out to Southern California to be with him and his family, and mm. um, which turned out to be a really good landing spot for me. And um, while I was there, um, within about six months, I unexpectedly found myself up at Golden Gate. Um, mm. I um, the the story is kind of interesting. My uh, brother's a <clears throat> he's a pastor at a friend's church. That's the denomination we grew up in. Oh, okay, uh, uh, kind of evangelical Quakers friends. Yeah. Um, and uh, so he was in Midway City in Orange County and uh, didn't have much of a youth group. And I was having a hard time finding a job, which I was uh, a little perplexed about. I, <laughs> I had a college degree. I had spent two years internationally. I spoke a foreign language and I couldn't find a job. It was, <laughs> I was like, what in the world? The American promise of education and mm -hmm. life experience was failing me. And so yeah. my brother said, well, why don't you help me in the church um, uh, with develop a kind of restart a youth ministry and so I happened to be in the office one day it was just me and there was a knock on the door and uh, uh, a retired gentleman from Wycliffe Bible Translators uh, was at the door he was looking for my brother whose name's Bruce mm -hmm. and got me instead and so that God really used that to um, set me on a whole new path I uh, began to talk with them about going to West Africa to use my French language, mm -hmm. to use my, um, I laugh because I had a, a, my college degree was in communications with a, an emphasis in public relations, which basically meant I took a, a news writing course and a photography class. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I could write <laughs> press releases and take pictures. <laughs> yeah. So, but they, uh, they saw me as someone who could, Wycliffe did, as someone who could become a, a liaison between the host government and their organization. So, mm -hmm. I was in a really accelerated process to go over to somewhere like the Ivory Coast or something. And, yeah. um, right, I mean, they, a wonderful organization, but I just really sensed that before I took the major step that was really unexpected, that probably a little more education would help me. And mm. uh, my fiance, or I guess she wasn't my fiance yet, but my soon to be fiance was studying up in Vancouver, BC, mm. um, doing her master's work there. And so when I began to look for seminaries, I initially thought, or at least of theological education, I initially thought of Regent, mm -hmm. which is up at UBC. And mm -hmm. at that time, they had such a tremendous faculty with uh, J.I. Packer and Eugene Peterson, yeah. and Stanley Grins, and I'm sure <laughs> right, others. Right. Um, yeah. And so, uh, but I wouldn't be able to work off campus as a foreign student there. Mm -hmm. And so um, I looked next at, well, Golden Gate just seemed to be a, a really natural fit for me is the same 
time zone because mm-hmm. again this was largely before cell phones and so right. we were able to <laughs> have a, a cheaper uh, international calling and uh-huh. <laughs> on the phone and so yeah I found myself up up here mm. uh, in Mill Valley very nice yeah well, how long did you study at Golden Gate? You've now, you have two degrees now from Golden Gate, is that right? I do, yeah. So I uh, arrived back in 97. I think I took about three and a half years to do my MDiv. <clears throat> took a long break, uh, just unexpectedly began to pastor here. That was not what I had initially intended to do. And mm-hmm. um, had a real strong sense back uh, in about uh, 2010. All of a sudden, I just sensed that I, I need to start thinking about more education, and that was an unexpected uh, thought to me. Um, and for some reason, I sensed that I needed to start something by 2012. I didn't know why. That mm-hmm. just I I knew that I needed to explore what programs were out there. What exactly, if this was from the Lord, what exactly I needed to be focused on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but 2012 seemed to be a strong sense of when I needed to begin something. And so I looked at, talked to a lot of people, looked at a lot of schools, everywhere from uh, Princeton, Gordon Conwell, uh, really, and all the way back then farther west on the west coast. Mm-hmm. Um, being here in the shadow of a seminary, um, and my alma mater even, right. um, uh, part of the big decision was not wanting to be far from my family, and yeah. uh, so that was an important part of the decision. But. I uh, was debating between a PhD and a DMIN work, and uh, even began to take courses to in Greek uh, for credit to right, right. Uh, prepare for D, uh, PhD because that's what I thought I would be going into. But mm-hmm. um, just realized after talking to several other people, professors among them, that uh, the doctor ministry was a better fit for me and mm-hmm. what I sensed God wanting to do in my life. And so, um, yeah, so I started uh, the doctor ministry program at Golden Gate in 2012, which mm. for some reason was that year I thought I should, yeah. and then graduated just this past May of 2016, mm. which uh, I, you know, you, you can interpret things uh, better um, uh, in hindsight, of course, and looking sure. back now with all of the transitions uh, yeah. at our church, mm-hmm. um, uh, being in a position then to both become lead pastor in March and then to graduate in May um, really began to I just laughed at that when I realized how God had orchestrated that you right. know even in the midst of my ignorance and you right. know my fumbling about just <laughs> trying my best to sure to follow where he was leading um, it was really interesting my wife noted too that when I graduated with my uh, my master of divinity back in 2000 that I became uh, pastor of Strawberry Community Church in May of that year, and then, or mm. in March of that year, oh, yeah. and then began, or got my degree then in May of that year, <laughs> and then 16 years later, I became pastor <laughs> at Tiburon Baptist Church in March and graduated with another degree mm-hmm. in May, so mm-hmm. that was kind of an interesting um, convening of yeah. events. You So talking about Tiburon Baptist Church, can you talk a little bit about what... <clears throat> What it it looks like the the changes have uh, that the church has gone through over the last especially year. Um, Tiburon Baptist Church is located um, not even a ten minute drive from the seminary campus in Mill Valley. For those who are listening, so it's it's very physically close and relationally close with the seminary. It was founded by seminarians, uh, mm-hmm. faculty, and students. Um, can you talk about so uh, what that looked like? There were there were there were five pastoral staff. Uh, goodness, I, actually, a little over a year ago, I think, is when the first first one of those moved on to uh, prepare for moving to Ontario, and and that person's changes. So, can we talk about that a little bit? Like, this is a local church watching the 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 campus relocation as closely as anybody else in the area that the seminary is vacating. Yeah. So so you were on staff at the time, not as lead pastor, you were at, what was your title at the time? I was pastor of young adults and families. Mm-hmm. Um, and when the news came that the seminary was leaving, it actually was announced on the April 1st. Right. And so um, I kind of 
assumed it was a joke mm. <laughs> or a bad joke at that and yeah. uh, and then it turned into initially it kind of received it as a bit of a nightmare it was a shock um, yeah. to me um, but uh, um, yeah we since that time we've we've seen our church has been not in for many years has not been dependent upon the seminary mm-hmm. um, as it's been well rooted now in the community sure. and, um, however um, there has been a growing reliance on seminarians um, in our church uh, in significant areas of leadership and um, relying on them for uh, Bible teaching, for uh, pulpit supply, mm-hmm. for um, uh, key leadership areas in the church. And, um, and that's been a, a happy development. It's uh, also, we've, we've noticed though, as the seminaries departed over the past year, we've seen many several of our key people uh, leaving transitioning out of course and yeah. then and then we had really some surprising um, it was a surprise to many in the church when uh, several of our pastors within a pretty short period of time yeah. um, one retired from uh, a music ministry position that she had led for over 30 years mm-hmm. uh, two others uh, were uh, deeply impacted by um, uh, the transition of the seminary and ended up having to in the relationship with the church um, to make move and to make you know right. adjustment in their life and so um, yeah for the past year the church has been sort of kind of wandering through its own little uh, wilderness time with yeah. um, I know there was a lot of relational loss in those leaders who left the pastors who left in particular mm-hmm. um, a lot of uh, well, maybe not a lot but there was a, a fair amount of curi- more than curiosity but just wonderment about um, how uh, the church would be affected, how her ministries would be affected. Yeah. And, um, but there was a diligent search committee um, that was established. A couple of people came in as interims in key roles uh, mm-hmm. for pastoral staff with executive pastoring. And then we had a, a, some interim fill-in for music ministry. And mm-hmm. uh, God provided a, a wonderful music minister for the church officially back in November. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's also a graduate of the seminary. Yeah, we um, actually spoke to him and his wife for oh, our good. podcast. Oh, good. Okay, uh, Steve and Powell. actually their episode releases today. Oh, okay. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> That's good timing. And then we also talked to uh, Dr. Glenn Prescott. Uh, his episode released quite a while ago now. Yes. But, uh, so... Prescott, as we talked about in that episode, is one of the ministers who left because he is moving to Ontario to pursue to continue to pursue his role with the seminary. And then uh, Steve Howell is this new music minister mm-hmm. who's joining or has joined ba- back in November, as you yes. mentioned, uh, Tiburon Baptist Church. Um, and then there's some other changes. So we there's another pastor who was our our new officially. Uh, new executive pastor right, yeah. uh, is Stephen Oki and he also is a graduate of the seminary mm-hmm. um, and uh, he, he came in to replace Glenn Prescott on an interim capacity and then the church has called him recently uh, actually effective July 1st so mm-hmm. very recently um, to continue in that role and then we our youth part time youth pastor Chris Harold is also a graduate of the seminary so uh, the church continues to benefit greatly from mm-hmm. our relationship with the seminary. Mm-hmm. I assume that will continue into the future, but um, it's a bit like a a rock that's been dropped in the water. <laughs> We've been, for the last year and a half or more, been yeah. kind of watching how the ripple affects, mm-hmm. how far they're going to go, and uh, how exactly they're going to impact uh, things. We've tried it as a church to... Um, Bracing for the impact is a little bit strong, but mm-hmm. just to prepare ourselves for things that we we think will likely result is the with the seminary's departure. Yeah, certainly understanding there are things that we can't possibly know uh, or the depth or scope of how those things will affect the, the church. But mm-hmm. um, you know, one of the areas that we're trying to really refocus our efforts is in uh, developing lay ministers and mm-hmm. putting putting a in strengthening a process for. Um, calling people into uh, lay and volunteer lead areas of ministry that are both significant and providing them the the training and help that they need and yeah. encouragement along the way, and that's that's been an area where the the maybe an over dependence on the seminary and especially for key areas of leadership mm-hmm. is, has has. Uh, 
is just a, an area of adjustment for sure. us that that I think is going to be healthy for us. And yeah. uh, we're also looking at you know with the I think the seminary I'm anticipating the seminary's departures impact on other churches. I think it's it's the seminary's been a bit of a source of of drawing various churches together, uh, at least been an identifiable spot, not just geographically, but kind of the hub around which we, we share, not even sharing ministry, but share an identity together. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's going to impact churches in in subtle ways over the next little while. And yeah. so we are trying um, to uh, increase our involvement with our local association mm-hmm. um, to see how God might want to um, work through us, not just for the benefit of our own church, but how how can we also help support and build up and encourage other churches, yeah. uh, you know, taking someone or letting God work through someone like a Steve Howell, who we've mentioned as a, a music minister, and how might he come and be a, a training resource for mm. a much smaller church or a church plant who yeah. may have a music minister who's... Um, Got less not, experience, less or, experience, mm-hmm. not paid by the church. Maybe mm-hmm. has a full time job elsewhere, and yeah. strictly, you know, maybe only has three hours a week to give to right. to planning and mm-hmm. uh, leading a church musically. And so, yeah. uh, Steve has had similar opportunities through the state convention, but um, I think uh, that might be potentially a role that our yeah. church can play in different ways to help support uh, other churches in the area. Having pastored a small church plant for nearly 10 years i appreciate the needs that, yeah, that sure, are there sure. um and can appreciate how those needs might be exacerbated without a ready pool of uh eager students or faculty or staff yeah. people from the seminary that can come and, and meet some of those needs and so yeah it's it's really going to impact i think a lot of churches here in the area yeah it's interesting it's an interesting challenge to watch i think um I think I mentioned this in our episode with Glenn Prescott, but Jonathan and I are both members at Tiburon Baptist Church, so we're watching these changes happen as uh, family after family, professor after professor, and student after student moves away. Mm-hmm. It's not like living through a church split, but people are leaving, yeah. which is what is in common with a church split. Yeah. So with a church split, people are leaving with angry hearts and faces, but... In, in this, there are tearful goodbyes, there are smiles shared over the good times, and, um, and it's, sure, it's, uh, there's sadness from the loss, like, we, we, we love the, the men and the women who were our, on our pastoral staff up until last year, um, but they, they are moving on to Ontario, or they're moving into retirement, and, and so we we say goodbye with a, a cheerful heart because we we love them and we will miss them. But it's so it's a different challenge. Seminaries don't move every other year. This is a pretty rare yes. occurrence in the life yes. of either a seminary or a church that lives near one. Yeah. Um, so it's an interesting and you, challenge. You and your family to, are are moving. Uh, this is your last Sunday with us. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's so right. We'll be saying goodbye to you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, so yeah. Um, so it's an interesting. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting challenge, and um, I think Tiburon Baptist Church is uh, as good a case study as any other for what kind of impact this would have for a mm-hmm. seminary uprooting and moving to a different location. Indeed. All right. Well, my next question here is: uh, What is your current role at Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary? Do you have any more? I don't have a role. No, I just time? finished my second degree. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've I've helped here and there with mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't even call it adjunct teaching, but just mm-hmm. um, supporting some TFE courses along the way. I've oh, okay. taught in the PMT mm-hmm. uh, area, but no no official capacity in any way. Right yeah, okay. now, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, what are some of your favorite memories of studying at Golden Gate Seminary? In this location, yeah, so sure. Some folks have visited the other campuses. Uh, yeah. This question pertains perhaps more to the faculty, especially because they sure. travel a lot more right. to the other campuses. Right. So, and maybe you've been to the others, but I it, actually have not. Okay, well then, perfect. What yeah. What are some of your favorite memories of studying at this this, is, this seminary? Yeah, this is a great question. I I knew I should have prepared some thoughts, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, a lot. I, I think I've experienced a lot of the seminary. Um, having done 
two different degrees, having come right after college and a mm. you know, short two-year mission experience. Um, so younger, having a little bit of experience in ministry, but not much really, and studying from that perspective up um, uh, was was really valuable. Uh, I lived, I initially lived in the men's dorm, mm. so I shared a room with someone, and um, so having actually lived on the campus in that capacity uh, for about a year and a half, and then my wife and I got married, so I moved into married housing. Mm. So having, you know, that was at the top of the hill up in Wallace Hall. Oh, and, Wallace, yeah. Uh, so in that little <laughs> horseshoe, and so mm-hmm. we were our first, uh, I mean, we had one, probably a $3 million view uh, inside sure. a little glorified studio apartment. Yeah, so. which bakes in May, yes, June. Yes, it does. It's hot. All sunlight all yeah, the time. No is. trees so to was, give you any shade. That's right, yeah. <laughs> But we, uh, the unit, that, the apartment we were in, um, I think we, it had been remodeled a few years before we moved mm-hmm. into it. And so um, we had we actually had the opportunity to meet the three previous couples who had lived there, <laughs> all newlyweds uh, when they moved in. So mm-hmm. that was their first shared home together. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was pretty fun. I think we're the fourth consecutive couple who moved into that apartment after it had been remodeled as mm-hmm. newlyweds. So mm-hmm. um, so that was kind of fun to carry on that tradition. <laughs> and, uh, I remember playing basketball down uh, on that outdoor court mm-hmm. uh, so often and um, having a lot of fun doing that. I um, helped years ago. Uh, the seminary had a little bit of money to help redo the um, kind of uh, the exercise room mm-hmm. that has some weight weight equipment and stuff and mm-hmm. so I helped uh, to lead a little group to make some proposals for uh, a way of improving that area so that was that was fun because I used to use that in fact one of <clears throat> when I was pastoring my last semester of seminary when I um, we had a um, a man who would just become a believer in Jesus and we had just baptized him and uh, we used to uh, he and I and another student used to meet there uh, we did this uh, we did this exercise diet program together and so I remember he used to pull up at my apartment and uh, I would blurry eyed wake roll out of bed and wake up and go down and he'd pick me up on his way from his apartment in Sausalito and then we'd go up to the campus um, um, weight room and we would do our exercise together and I remember he would have his Christian music blaring in his car when I'd open the door. It was the same <laughs> CD every day because it was he was just brand new to Christian music and to Christian life. And, yeah. Um, so that was that's a, a fun fun memory. <laughs> um, you know the um, I think the classes um, back when I, I was first here, um, I had a lot of uh, favorite professors. Two of them were. Uh, Dwight Honeycutt and Stan Nelson. Stan Nelson used to teach theology. Okay. Uh, he retired many years, several years ago. But uh, I remember watching. I'd be in one or the other class, and um, so I might be in Dr. Nelson's class, and all of a sudden he would stop, and there in the doorway was Dr. Honeycutt, and they would just have a a two minute bantering session <laughs> of you know just kind of guy humor. Um, sort of picking on each other in a light-hearted, <laughs> funny way, and mm-hmm. I thought, you know, it was it was really fun to see these guys who were much older than me and um, uh, people I, you know, continue to hold in high esteem. But it was just fun to see the uh, the sense of humor that they had and the uh, the way that they shared life together in that mm-hmm. way was was really great. Um, um, so I guess you know, having now been a student as you know, an older, an older student, um, having just done my second degree and mm-hmm. um, seeing things now with, now that I have children, um, uh, and really seeing the value of education uh, from that perspective and mm-hmm. some of the challenges that that present presents is in having going through uh, an educational process with children and uh, expanded responsibilities. It's it's yeah. a much different uh, reality. So I'm. I'm glad I was able to do it earlier, um, in one sense, at least one degree. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, it's. I just have some sweet memories. A lot of friends that I've made. Um, to where my wife and I shared our first years together, mm-hmm. um, and that was it was very special um, in so many ways for us. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm no, drawing fine. a blank all of a sudden. That's all right. Uh, my next question is: uh, you can is something you can take 
any way you'd like. <clears throat> it's <clears throat> what is your most prized achievement that you earned while at this campus? That could be either a literal piece of paper or uh, or achievement like statue or name on a plaque or something, or it could be something else, something more metaphorical. Mm. Um, different people have answered different ways. So, what would you say for Bryce Butler? What is your most prized achievement that you earned at the Mill Valley campus here? Directly from the campus or in my ministry life? Okay. <laughs> um, I think it's the people that I've had the opportunity to baptize over the years. Mm. I mean, that... <clears throat> I think it's in Thessalonians when uh, Paul writes uh, that to the believers there that they themselves are are his reward. Mm-hmm. Won't, won't you be our reward? And um, the thought of um, uh, not just seeing people in heaven, but being part of of another person's journey of discovery, of um, watching how God revives their life and mm-hmm. tunes them them in. Um, Miguel Rodriguez, my friend, your friend too, yeah. um, shared recently that um, there, uh, someone has developed a, a special pair of glasses for colorblind people. Right. Yeah. And those who have not seen colors, or I don't understand colorblindness very well, but um, whatever they couldn't see before, they put these glasses on, and now they see the world completely differently. Mm-hmm. And watching that from a spiritual point of view, people who you know have lived sometimes very happy secular lives but all of a sudden being gripped by God and having a life where he puts his glasses over them and now they see the whole world in a completely different light in a completely Mm -hmm. different way uh, with all new purpose and a whole new focus Um, that's really been the delight of my life we Mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, see people who you know didn't even you'd mention the word Easter to them and they had no concept of even what Easter was. Now, that, that was just really shocking mm-hmm. to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm here. A little different from Oklahoma. Very, I, very I different than Oklahoma. <laughs> um, but even here in California, this is sure. someone who grew up in Oregon even. And so, mm-hmm. you know, uh, wasn't even a, a foreign-born necessarily person. But uh, so it's people like that um, that has been, I think, for me, just the greatest delight in watching them. I. I think, uh, well, that that would that would by far be the greatest um, achievement uh, for me. It's just, I think, I I often get overwhelmed thinking that God would work His gospel through my life somehow. That He's mm-hmm. He allows me to take a front row seat to to His work in people's life, and you know, it's. Uh, it's a humbling thought to me. I I feel like the most undeserving, kind of like mm-hmm. the Hobbit, you know, he <laughs> took this unexpected journey. And, you know, the fact yeah. that I, I do what I do and do it where I do it um, is just the most remarkable, unexpected journey that I, you know, I, I couldn't have written this the way it is. And, mm. um, but that, that's been a real, real great, great joy for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before the announced sale of the Mill Valley campus on April 1st, 2014, what was your impression of the relationship between Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary's Mill Valley campus and her neighbors? Before the sale. Yeah, so <clears throat> before you heard anything about that, so yeah. in everything leading up to 2014. Yeah. What was your general impression of the um, relationship between the community and I, I'd, the seminary? I'd say, you know, I arrived back in 97. I think it's grown. Um, uh, I was here when uh, Dr. Cruz was president, and mm-hmm. I used to be part of um, some um, uh, leadership luncheons that he he organized uh, to try to connect with some, some people around. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, it's there's been some people that I met over the years that, didn't always have a favorable view necessarily for whatever reason. I don't couldn't even give specifics, but uh, um, I think especially once uh, President Orge arrived, um, I can only guess at some of the reasons, but I think he he brought a, a renewed enthusiasm um, and a desire to um, 
to connect more intentionally with the community. You know, mm-hmm. he, he knows the seminary is not a, a church, and the church has its own work to do, and the seminary, its work is different. And yeah. so, uh, but um, I think wanting to um, to bless the community, to um, um, I, I, I think it was just a much warmer um, interaction in, in recent years. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that was been, that was a really really fun thing for my wife and I to watch Um, yeah everything from like the Mill Valley Philharmonic being invited to come and share and um, I think the uh, seminary gave a gift to them and so Mm -hmm. all sorts of other other things that big and small that I think really were um, were interesting diffuse a diffusing aspect of the the seminary's culture and presence into the the community more and more um, was was really really good to see I think Golden Gate Academy over time has mm. been a, a real um, kind of public face for at least a, a few families here. And I think about the time the seminary uh, made the announcement, uh, that little preschool was, um, I think, 80 or 90 percent non-seminary related. Mm. And so yeah, that, that, I think, helped bolster the, at least for some, um, their appreciation for the seminary and yeah. Um, yeah yeah all right how did that change how did that impression of the relationship between the seminary and the community how did that change if at all after the current president dr jeff orge announced that sale on april 1st 2014 do you think the nature of that relationship changed at all do you think that was a a moment that changed the relationship between the seminary and the neighbors or was it essentially the um, same? I, I think else? it was a surprise to a mm-hmm. lot of neighbors. You know, there were there was a, a new neighborhood association that was formed uh, specifically to oppose the um, the redevelopment plan that the seminary put forward. And mm-hmm. you know, it's a, it's a multifaceted um, disagreement. Um, mm-hmm. Dealt with you know unincorporated areas and county county plans versus agreed upon local development plans and um, but the seminary was in kind of a tight spot um, Mm -hmm. with its ability to re just update its infrastructure and Mm -hmm. to do some things to establish it for another 50 plus years Um, I think a lot of local residents were really shocked um, Mm -hmm. when I don't think they thought the seminary would (laughs) ever be able to sell or move and I (laughs) You know, I, I think point. I think there were some. Uh, I, I I think there's a. I'm not sure sympathy is the right word, but um, I think some renewed appreciation <laughs> for oh, the sure. seminary mm-hmm. and the type of uh, students that it brings, um, the type of community it that allows the Strawberry Point area particularly to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that. Um, now the local community is in a fight for its life as to what will become of that seminary property. Yeah. So I think because of that, there's a, a renewed, in some ways, a renewed appreciation, at least, for what has been there. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but I, it's hard to say. I, it's hard for me to connect directly to the sale sure. of the property. Sure. Um, I think some people thought maybe it was just sort of a... Well, I shouldn't even say that. But sure. Some people... Uh, I, some people wondered if it was just sort of a spiteful response uh, oh. to the community's um, um, lack of enthusiasm for the seminary's development plan. Okay, uh, but I think that's I, too I, major of a, pro- a project to undergo to do it out of spite. Well, right, that's right, that's right. You know, I, I, I've heard you know a couple of conversations sure. like that. I, people I don't, can feel how they feel, I, but yeah, I'm I don't pretty think confident that's indicative. Not oh, sure, no, I'm case. not. And I'm not suggesting that at all. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people here really, local people, don't have a lot of concept of what a seminary is. Yeah. In fact, usually when I introduce myself or talk to them about where I was educated, I usually have to tell people it's a graduate school. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, most people just have very little concept here about what a seminary is yeah. and what it, what it does. <laughs> and, um, sometimes they're like, oh, when I tell them, well, I, that's why there's a seminary drive exit off the freeway, because there's a seminary right here. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, so so that's, that's always been fun. Yeah, I had someone ask me when I mentioned that 
I had a similar conversation with someone, and they <clears throat> they said, "I didn't know there was a cemetery around." Yeah, that's There's right. expensive <laughs> land for a cemetery. In that's right. Well, that's the old preacher's joke, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> living Christians go to the the cemetery, and then they die when they come out. Yeah. <laughs> not not so at Golden Gate. It's it's a life giving yeah. institution, no doubt. Well, my next question is: Were you in on the discussions surrounding the potential sale before it was finalized? Uh, I was a little bit. Um, I uh, not in any decision uh, conversations. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. a few. Um, uh, only because having had the privilege of owning a home here in Mill Valley, mm -hmm. I was able to represent um, uh, the seminary in one of the conversations with the county. Um, um, at a public meeting to mm. uh, speak in support of the seminary's development plan. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't, I guess your question was about the sale of the property. Yeah. So, no, it wasn't about the sale. It was about the uh, development okay. uh, plan ahead of time to try mm -hmm. to uh, have local support to express that uh, in a positive way. And, yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, no, not about the sale. In fact, I was, I was shocked, just yeah. like every, many people were. Yeah. But had no idea. Most people that we've <laughs> talked with have said no, and that just kind of confirms that Dr. Orge and the administration kept it very close to the, the chest as they worked out that deal with North Coast Land Holdings. Yes. Um, what was your opinion about the sale at that time? You've mentioned that you were shocked. Um, did you think that was the right move for the seminary at that time? Did you Were you so shocked you didn't really know what to think about it yet? What did you feel... What was your opinion about it on in that period, on that day, or in that week, that sort of period yeah. of time? Um, my initial response was strictly emotional. Just, mm -hmm. yeah, it was nostalgic and uh, um, um, blended with um, just a thought of, you know, I'm not overly, um, not overly... Um, set toward um, uh, particular locales uh, in that sense so I, I don't have great necessarily super nostalgia for former places I've gone to school mm. the relationships yes but sure. the physical space not not so much mm. um, but uh, you know I, I actually remember Jeff Ward's um, in some teaching maybe a sermon sometime uh, several years ago talking about uh, um, when people are, are in leadership capacities that sometimes you just have to trust that they have information perhaps that you don't and that they um, you assume the best that they're they're making good decisions unless you have information to the contrary and mm -hmm. so having no information to the contrary I tried to to take that basic principle mm -hmm. and to assume that that there were good reasons uh, for it. Um, I think this, you know, the I've seen people move away from here, a place that's in great need of Christian influence and presence. Uh, I think that was the hardest thought is that, um, you know, why Southern California, at least to my, my mind, has a tremendous amount of Christian influence and um, mm -hmm. unlike Northern California. And so yeah. that, that to me was probably the hardest part of just thinking you know the the potential influence and ongoing impact of of a multitude of believers right here is going to be lost and so yeah. um so i think that that was the most difficult part yeah well it's late july 2016 the vast majority of the campus has moved um in all of our other interviews pretty much it was uh, leading up to it, so only a few months away, only a month away, or it's happening right now. It's pretty much happened at this point. They've uh, everyone who's going to Ontario has pretty much gone, with a very few exceptions. Yeah. And um, buildings are vacated. The seminary has completely vacated two of the three main buildings and handed them over free and clear to the new owners. Um, they're setting up the the new Bay Area campus to temporarily use. The classroom building here in Mill Valley for one more semester, but they're not quite done with that yet. So they're all in the middle of all of that stuff. We're in the we're in the we're on the other side of the thickest part of the move. Has your opinion about the sale changed since what you just shared with me? Since 
how you felt about it back in 2014. It, yes. Because you've now um, lived through a lot of it. Yes. Um, you know, I, I've, I've embraced the move. I'm not upset to, about it and never really have been. I've been saddened by it. Um, mm-hmm. I was able to sit at the, uh, and to hear Jeff Ward share, uh, you know, some additional information. I've, I've heard him report on it three mm-hmm. or four times in different uh, venues. Uh, but at the missions conference, he uh, he shared um, some additional pieces, of just helping to see. It seems in some ways uh, identifiable of God's fingerprints in this. Um, just the unlikelihood that the property could be sold, and right. the very what seemed to be an increasing likelihood that they would constantly have problems trying to de- to develop their physical space here in a uh, a way that was. Um, livable, manageable, sustainable for the future. So, yeah. um, so that that helped me a lot. Um, and you know, knowing, you know, again, that the mission of a seminary is not the same as the mission of a church. And so they, it does make a lot of sense for them to be in the heart of where there are a lot of Christian people that um, could um, benefit even more from in the kingdom. I hope and think will be benefited even more from the seminary's presence in a much larger community yeah. um, of where there's a higher percentage of believers. And so, you know, it, the challenge, you know, if churches have been overly reliant on the seminary to do the church's work, then that's a problem. Yeah. And so I think churches like mine and me personally um, am being renewed with a challenge or being rechallenged, I guess, to reconsider what our what God desires to do through us as a church here mm-hmm. um, that's not the seminary's work and so um, the church is called to be the salt and light of God into the community and so um, so that that's both challenging because that's a cultural change mm-hmm. I think for at least in some ways a church like ours in, in some ways sure. um, um, and is going to force us to um, be even more uh, strategic, more integrated into the community, and more purposeful in what we do. Um, mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, that's. Uh, I think my thoughts have changed quite a bit. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're down to our final question. Okay. What do you hope the seminary will prioritize as they make and, at this point, finish this uh, historic transition? Well, it's, um, I know it's uh, had a strong and long focus on developing leaders to fulfill the, the Great Commission, and um, I, I just hope that that continues to be its, its uh, forward thrust. I, you know, I, uh, it's obviously, as far as I can tell, and I don't, I don't presume to know all of the details, even the, the very public details of what life in Ontario is going to be like for a student. Um, but I do know the cam- the nature of a campus living is just going to shift some things um, uh, in the sense of the... It, they're going to... Ha- I, I think the whole purpose part of it is the seminary now is delivering even more consistently theological education into the actual places where people minister so they're not pulling people away for a time um, yeah. in some you know a good healthy but in some ways artificial setting and then sending them back into places of yeah. full-on engaged ministry so um, I would think because of that people are going to be much more um, I hope students will be much more integrated into the community itself while they're students there there's long been a joke about this campus here um, or a reference to it being sort of the, the seminary bubble. And, you know, and it's easy. Yeah. You know, you get up there, your your primary friends or other believers who are also connected to the seminary in some way. And mm-hmm. and so it's it's been a challenge for a lot, you know, at times for many of those students to, to have significant relationships with unbelievers or unchurched people in this local area. And so... Um, that's really not your question. What do I, <laughs> what do I hope they, they focus on yeah, and prioritize? What do, you hope, what do you hope is one of the priorities they focus on? Is it, I guess another way to, to state it in this period. 
because things can get lost, things can get reorganized, yeah. um, new things can be added. We've heard a lot of different answers yeah. to this last question. Um, you know, I've, I've not really thought about it. I, I guess that's why I think the nature of what the school is going to be it will be different without the the residential component, and yeah. so. I think there are good things in that. Like I said, you know, being diffused into the community much more. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, it's hard to know exactly what that impact is going to be on students. Um, but um, what do I hope? What the priority? Well, that's a hard question. I don't. <laughs> uh, it doesn't have to be number one priority. Yeah, yeah. Just, just. One of them. You mentioned that you hope they continue focusing on what they've been good at, which is raising up leaders. Yes, you did mention that. Uh, and that, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you know the leadership of President Orge. Um, I think with him at the helm, the seminary will continue to accomplish great things and to be newly established there. Mm -hmm. I think that that will be a, a cutting edge for him continually, as to to develop those people whom God will work through. To raise up others in their particular ministry settings. So, um, yeah, I guess that, as far as a priority, I would hope that that continues to be, to be its priority. The, you know, it's uh, <clears throat> there was a time, at least when I came here, because I came here originally to do missions, and my ori original degree that I started to do was in intercultural studies, and. Uh, in fact, I I got a letter from the seminary that I was the first official student. Um, admitted into that new program when it was mm -hmm. developed, and so, um, uh, so I, I hope that the seminary continues to have that global missions edge and focus mm -hmm. too, and that that continues to be a priority. I know the Kim School has mm -hmm. been really helpful in that. They've hosted many missions conferences, and but it's more than that. I just I hope it continues to be a. Um, just a place where mission, uh, missional ethos is developed, is encouraged, is fostered and mm. spawned out in, into many students' lives, and, and that students continue to come and be part of the seminary because of its focus um, mm. in that. You know, it used to be the 1040 window, and then it became the right. Pacific Rim, and um, uh, so wherever it is, I, I do hope that that continues to stay a, a major point of priority for them. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bryce Butler, thank you for meeting with me. I'm so grateful for everything you shared, all the stories and um, connection points. I think this is another helpful perspective to add to the study we're doing on what the seminary, who the seminary was yeah. at this point in her history. Well, it's my pleasure. I appreciate the time. I'm glad we were able to make the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just by a hair's breadth here before you depart. But, yeah. uh, praying for you and your family and thank you. And for the seminary. And I think God's got great great things ahead for her and for the churches in Marin. I'd just ask anybody who's listening today that uh, uh, you'd pray for the churches right here in Marin County uh, yeah. during during this transition time. Some have already been hard hit and yeah. are in some major transitions and but I, I think God will work through and bless this season and make make her churches even stronger is, is my prayer and invite anybody listening to pray for that. That was Dr. Bryce Butler, pastor of Tiburon Baptist Church and alumnus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. I enjoyed listening to, to Bryce's interview. I, I think navigating the intricacies of um, marriage and international issues while being a student is an uh, interesting part of his, his story. Uh, yeah. It's not, it's not something that everyone goes to, goes through, but it is a component of a reasonable portion of the seminary, uh, of our seminarians' experience to to work with that uh, yeah. as we've seen from some of our other interviews true and it, it's it's nice to hear from somebody in the community who stood for the seminary on the seminary's behalf um 
advocating for a reason for the seminary to stay when the the county and the committee had those meetings to meet with the community and talk about what it would be like for the seminary to have this new master plan that they proposed back in 2009. That was, that was very helpful. And I was encouraged by Bryce's um, anecdotes. Agreed. It was, it was warm. He, he doesn't seem to have ill will against the seminary and he right. doesn't have ill will against his neighbors. Yeah. It, it can be easy to be angry at or bitter toward people who have con conflicting ideas of the good. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad to see that that's not where Bryce is at. Yeah. Well, that was a real, real good episode, I thought, real good interview. But we have another one coming up next week. Next week... Our episode will be with Dr. Kelly Campbell, Associate Dean of Information Services and Director of the Library at Columbia Theological Seminary. We are interviewing a library director at a different institution because Kelly Campbell was the Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary Library Director from 2003 to 2013. That's right. Well. In August, we unfortunately only released one episode, uh, that being with church planter Mark Gentomasso, currently based on the East Coast. Uh, we had hoped to release this one in August, but due to technical difficulties on my part, uh, it got delayed until September. So in September, we will release four episodes of our campus relocation project. And in fact, these are the final four episodes of this volume. So this week you've got Dr. Bryce Butler. Next week you've got Kelly Campbell. We would like to thank all of our participants in this project. Uh, Adam and I learned a, a great deal through the, the process. We'll reflect more on that in the weeks to come. Episode 15 with uh, Dr. Kelly Campbell will be available one week from today on September 9th. Once again, uh, I think Kelly's interview is going to be one that you'll want to hear. Yeah. You don't want to miss this, so if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. And so that other people can hear about our, our podcast, please rate and review. Um, it looks like some word of mouth has gotten around and we've gotten an uptick in uh, our downloads. So those of you who've been spreading the word, we really appreciate uh, all of your help spreading um, this research project and labor of love to other people. That's right. And anything you, you feel like doing on iTunes or your podcast app would be helpful. Like even just giving a rating, a, some sort of star rating. Um, I personally really like five stars i think that's the right number of stars personally <laughs> and i certainly would never pander ever to <laughs> our listeners in any way certainly not i don't what do you like, think jonathan i don't like podcasts i love them <laughs> i don't love them i don't listen <laughs> that's right that <laughs> my friends, is a not-so-deep cut uh, to a particular Pixar film. Jonathan, do you have anything else before we wrap up this episode? I'm really, really sorry, Pixar, for doing that to your, your <laughs> film. Um... Are you? Are you? <laughs> All right, folks. May God bless you as you go. He's already gone before. <laughs> <laughs>